Trust in politics is broken. So can we get UK politics working again? That was the last time we were happy. 2012. I'm Beth Rigby, Sky's political editor. Join me every week with Labour's Jess Phillips and Conservative peer Ruth Davidson for some electoral dysfunction. This idea of nuance has completely left politics. Yeah. Together, we'll focus on the policies that could deliver political satisfaction. Follow electoral dysfunction wherever you get your podcasts. A proxy conflict no more. Overnight, Israel hit back in its bloody tit-for-tat with Iran. This time, Iran says explosions were heard near the city of Isfahan. But the government is downplaying the attack, saying nothing was hit and, significantly, that they have no plans to retaliate. Israel, unsurprisingly, is similarly saying little. But we know that air defences were triggered above not only a major military air base near Isfahan, but also over one of Iran's many nuclear facilities. I'm Neil Patterson, and in today's Sky News Daily, we'll be asking why Isfahan and if this is the beginning or the end of escalation in the Middle East. A little later, we will head to Israel, where our international affairs editor, Dominic Wykhorn, has been watching how the world responded to those latest strikes. The rules have shifted, and that does make the region a more dangerous place, even though it looks as though now the immediate danger of a much bigger war seems to have been averted. Uh, but first up, let's speak to Sean Bell, our military analyst. Sean, good to talk to you again. Look, how much do we actually know about what happened last night? Because at first glance, not much. Uh, very little we actually know, and I suspect that's going to remain the case because Israel rarely comments about these sorts of attacks and Iran will not want to showcase what damage that uh, Israel has done. They will want to sweep it under the carpet and move on. They've been very clear that actually they don't see this as uh, any need of retaliation. And in many ways, that ambiguity is probably a very good sign because if Israel or Iran was to, um, to actually advertise what had happened, that might contribute to escalation. I think the mood music means that it looks both sides are looking to draw a line under this. What do we know, though, of the, this, this central Iranian city of uh, Isfahan? Certainly there are a number of reasons as to why it might be somewhere that, that Israel could at the very least signal that it could strike properly if it wanted to. I think there's a number of things there. Isfahan has got some nuclear research facility there. There's over 3,000 scientists that work in the region. There's also a military airfield there. Um, there was a concern that Israel might attack um, more high-end nuclear uh, development capability. They've not, not done that. Uh, and so far, we've also seen no reports of casualties. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if there's a lot of diplomatic messaging being going on behind the scenes to be able to conduct a a, a relatively surgical strike. I think what's been fascinating, though, from my perspective, the three positives that Israel would take away from this, one of which is that Netanyahu would have wanted to have the last word, and this allows him to have the last word. He's conducted an attack. Secondly, the target appears to be something that's directly linked to the attacks uh, last Saturday. And thirdly, and I think most tellingly from a military perspective, uh, Iran threw basically the kitchen sink at Israel uh, last weekend, 331 missiles and rockets, and yet largely ineffective against the alliance of America and Israel predominantly, um, whereas Israel was able to conduct a very limited surgical strike, and it does appear that got through. That's a powerful message to Iran not to escalate because they will get involved in a conflict that they can't win. I mean, I've heard reports that there were some F-14 Tomcats uh, stored there that were, that, were, that were taken out or perhaps even targeted in this attack. Correct me if I'm wrong here, wasn't that the plane that Tom Cruise flew in Top Gun many, many years ago? Uh, yeah, you're betraying your, uh, your age there a little bit, Neil, but you're absolutely right. Because this portends to an era when America and uh, Iran were much closer and um, the legacy is that the Iranians still have some very old technology. And the problem with fighter jets is that they look good at air shows, whizzing around, lots of noise, very fast. But the technology in the fighter jets, the radars, the electronic warfare, the countermeasures, the missiles, that is where technology has moved on a pace. And that is where Israel has kept 
kept pace with that technology, whereas Iran has not. But the harsh reality is a big tube full of fuel and tipped with ammunition, I'm afraid, it doesn't cut it in today's high-tech world. You have to have lots of other technology wrapped in software, in technology that uh, Iran doesn't have. And it blatantly becomes apparent when these sorts of uh, strikes are conducted. And I think that's why most uh, analysts believe that Iran doesn't want to pick a fight with Israel because it's a fight it can't win. So given that the nuclear science is taking place in this part of the world, we, we should then perhaps take this as a very direct signal from Israel to Iran saying, look, we know where the things are, we know where your manpower is, and we can take it out if we want to. Yes, but Iran has long argued that it's not trying to pursue a nuclear weapons program and all of this is being done purely for peaceful means. But the uh, evidence suggests they're enriching uranium much closer to what you would need for a nuclear weapon. And the harsh reality is that the only guarantor of security for Iran in this very dangerous world would be to develop nuclear weapons. And it seems to be they're continuing to progress towards that aim. But to riff on your point about uh, the Iranian capabilities, one then presumes that Israel's strike on Iran and uh, in the way in which it was able apparently to get past Iran's air defences points up some pretty significant problems with their defences as well. Absolutely. With the advent of stealth technology, you know, Israel has F-35. It's not invisible, but it allows you to get closer to an enemy before it can see you. Electronic warfare allows you to seduce the radar. So if an Iranian radar was looking at me as a fighter pilot in my joint strike fighter, I can seduce that radar to actually believing that I'm actually somewhere else and not where I am actually, forcing the Iranians to fire a missile, a shadow, and that betrays where the radar is, it betrays where the surface-to-air missile system is and allows me to use technology to take that out. And that is where, away from the Top Gun film using your analogy, which is all about missiles and bangs and crashes, actually warfare is struck now much more in the technology regime and that's where the West has a huge advantage. Sean, thanks very much indeed. In just a moment, we'll get the view from Jerusalem with our international affairs correspondent, Dominic Wycombe. Back soon. OK, we turn our attention to Jerusalem now. Our international affairs editor, Dominic Wycorn, has been there watching the response to this latest attack. Look, Dom, our response wasn't unexpected. I would say there was almost an inevitability to it. What was not inevitable was where and how hard they would strike. Does it seem to you that the Israelis perhaps did listen to the Americans and others urging a little caution? Certainly looks like it. And it is, I think, still quite hard to say because the information we're getting is still quite murky. But in terms of what the Israelis have apparently done and also what the Iranians have said in response and how they've reacted, it looks like it's following a script that Israel's uh, Western allies will be relieved with. And anybody who cares about stability uh, in the region will also uh, be relieved by because the Israelis were urged by the Americans originally to do nothing, to take the win. And then when it seemed inevitable, they would have to do something, particularly because of the strength of opinion here, both inside and outside government, then they were urged to show restraint, to send a message, but not to go so far that they would plunge the entire region into a much bigger war. The fact that it seems limited and the fact that the Iranians have effectively said, move along, there's not an awful lot to look at here, please go back to normal. It does look as though the Iranians are not leaping on this as an excuse to launch all-out war against Israel, which I think was the expectation because the Iranians, it's always been assumed, do not want a much bigger war. So a message sent to the Iranians via this attack, quite clearly, Dom, but also, interestingly, a message sent to the Americans ahead of this attack, unlike, of course, what happened uh, when the Israelis struck the uh, Syrian consulate building on the 1st of April. Yeah, well, that's right, yeah. If you go back to April the 1st, the Israelis decided to attack that embassy compound in Damascus and didn't really warn the Americans, barely warned their own intelligence agencies, according to some reports, because their assumption seems to have been they could get away with it, as they have uh, by hitting any number of Iranian and other targets uh, since October the 7th. None of those attacks have led to a massive response from the Iranians. And it seems their expectation was that the same would happen attacking this embassy compound, even though it's sovereign diplomatic territory, even though there was the greater number of high-level Iranian figures in that embassy than have been targeted by Israel before. The Iranians didn't see that way. They felt that they had to respond, that otherwise they would look weak. And then they crossed their own red line by attacking Israel. 
But I think the problem for the region is that, for a number of reasons, a number of rules have been broken, but particularly that rule that the Iranians set themselves, that they had a red line they would never cross, directly attacking Israel. It would be too costly. They've done so now. So the fear amongst Israelis is if they attack an Iranian nuclear scientist, if something goes bang in Tehran, they can't assume now that Iran will not strike back directly. The rules have shifted, and that does make the region a more dangerous place, even though it looks as though now the immediate danger of a much bigger war seems to um, have been averted. And one has to presume that those concerns will be shared by plenty of people in Washington, of course. What, what Dom, are we to read into the fact that, that, that Anthony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, the US Foreign Secretary in essence, uh, speaking at that G7 meeting of, of, of foreign ministers, barely said anything about what had happened in terms of the Israeli strike on Iran beyond making it absolutely clear that the United States had not been involved in it? Yeah, he said a few things. He said that America had not been involved. He said he couldn't confirm what had happened. He also said that America does still not want to have a major offensive by Israel into Rafah. And the reason that's connected is some reports have claimed the Israelis had said to the Americans, we will do what you say, we will limit our retaliation against Iran on the understanding that you let us do what we want to do in Rafah. That's the southern bit of Gaza where two million Gazans have retreated to because of the onslaught further north, but where Israel believes Hamas leadership is still based, so Israel wants to go in there. Uh, and there was th these reports that some kind of deal has been done. So I think it was significant that Blinken pushed back against that in the same conference talking about this uh, apparent attack on Iran. But the fact that he hasn't confirmed it, I think, just follows the same thing as we've been saying about the Israelis. No one's saying much about this because no one wants to goad the other side into do anything, doing anything uh, too rash. Still, what has been the domestic response to Israel's retaliation, to Iran's retaliation, to Israel's strike on Damascus? I ask only because, on the face of it, there may well be some people, particularly even those close to Benjamin Netanyahu, who feel that Israel could and should have done much more. I mean, one member of the, the far right of the coalition that Netanyahu operates within described it as, well, in one word, feeble. Yeah, and that one word tweet is actually the only comment we've had so far from the Israeli government confirming it's happened. And we assume that Itamar Ben-Gavir was referring to this attack. It didn't make it very clear, but that's the assumption. And he's not happy with it because he's from the far right end of things politically. Uh, he is in this coalition with Benjamin Netanyahu, and he's been pushing for much more aggressive action, both in Gaza, but also against Iran. And on the right of Israeli politics, there's a real fear that that deterrence that Israel relies upon, that deters other enemies doing their worst against Israel, that has been fundamentally undermined by October the 7th, but also by that failure of anticipating Iran's retaliation to the attack on the embassy, but also they fear now by not doing enough against Iran. And Israelis are acutely aware of the failure that has come about and, and yeah. what's happened to Jewish people historically by relying on other nations and other friends to keep them safe. You know, Israel was set up partly because Jews felt they couldn't rely on other people to protect them against what's happened to them over history. So I think, you know, for the Prime Minister to look like he was bowing to a certain extent to friends and allies, but still people outside of Israel, that's difficult for the Israeli leader to do. But there is, yes, certainly a lot of dissatisfaction still about where this leaves Israel, which was already in a very vulnerable, exposed place in the wake of October the 7th. What then, Dominic, about the man that faces Benjamin Netanyahu, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, what, what do we know about this individual? We, we've talked an awful lot about Benjamin Netanyahu, but but precious little about the Ayatollah so far. That's very true. And Ali, Ali Khamenei is a mystery. And, you know, Iranian government is, is a riddle. It's an enigma. Um, and it's very hard to read. He is the supreme leader. Below him, there's a whole range of different government organisations. There's the president, there's the parliament, uh, there's the IRGC. There are lots of security agencies. But the assumption, I think, amongst most observers and, and from someone who's, who's, who's visited the country, the impression you get is the one person who really counts is the supreme leader, Ali Khamenei. And as to what his intentions are, the most important thing he cares about is grip on power, the survival of the Islamic revolution and the exporting of that revolution across the region. Therefore, they found common cause with any organisation that believes Israel doesn't have a right to exist, that's opposed to Israel's uh, influence and hegemony in the region and also uh, to Americas. So on the one hand, how many, I think, would have relished an encounter against Israel that will burnish his anti-Zionist credentials? On the other hand, he would have been very wary of anything that would escalate into a situation of war he couldn't control that would have threatened his grip on power. 
Fresh sanctions have also been announced, Dom. Any chance that this round of sanctions will actually have noticeable effect, noticeable to, to, to the likes of me, uh, rather than perhaps people like yourself who move in the diplomatic circles? I don't think so. And I, th- I think, you know, Iran is, is the most sanctioned regime on earth. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard to work out exactly what was left to sanction. I think Britain's found a few more individuals to sanction. Uh, it's become extremely adept at dodging sanctions. It's found friends largely to the east, um, but also over the Persian Gulf, who've been able to aid and abet them in their uh, sanctions evasion, in the same way as Russia has also found willing accomplices in sanctions evasion. It's, it's an extremely challenged economy, but it has been able to continue without threatening the regime. And I think that's likely to last. I think that the significance of the sanctions in this particular episode was that the West was able to say to Israel, we had your back on Saturday, we defended you as we said we would. That anti-missile, that air defence system we put in place, not just with us, but also the Arab states, worked incredibly well. That's something you have to take as a win. But also the fact that we've got you back diplomatically, we are going to help you diplomatically, we're going to sanction Iran. And that may have been part of... Uh, the calculus that Netanyahu was weighing up as he as he was sort of veering between those on the right saying you've got to hit Iran very hard and his allies saying show some restraint. Uh, Dom, just to conclude, what, what do you make of the fact that yet again uh, Palestine seeking statehood at the United Nations uh, has that application for uh, member status uh, blocked, vetoed uh, by the United States, the United Kingdom abstaining on this issue? Well, I think on the one hand, it was inevitable because both Britain and America believe that Palestine should only be created as part of a two-state solution. And that, that can't happen unilaterally. That has to involve negotiations uh, with Israel. It has to be the outcome of, of negotiations, uh, not imposed on the region. But yeah, there is a kind of momentum here that's building. A number of countries voted for the recognition of Palestine as a, a state within um, the UN. I think what it shows Israel, though, at the UN, that there is a continuing ostracization of Israel. The longer this war goes, on, the more it is losing support diplomatically and in terms of public opinion around the world. And therefore, that's why I think we're also going to see more and more pressure on Israel to try and bring this war in Gaza to an end and also pressure on Hamas to release these hostages. And the bad news on that front is that Hamas now say they believe they only have 20 women, men over a certain age and sick hostages to return. Now, the Israelis say that's an extraordinary act of bad faith when they said they had 40. But there is going to be, I think, a renewed, redoubled effort diplomatically on both Hamas through Qatar and also in Israel to try and bring this war to an end. Because what we've seen is the spectre of all-out war looming over the region. And that doesn't go away as long as this war continues. Dom, thank you. It's certainly difficult to see a sovereign nation striking another within its borders, its military sites in fact, as an opportunity for de-escalation. But that will be the hope as the international community engages in yet another round of diplomacy in the margins and back channels. Both Israel and Iran have flexed their muscles. Both have a narrative to sell to their domestic audiences. But... Israel's focus is not merely on Iran. Lebanon and Hezbollah are also on their radar, not to mention Rafa in Gaza's south. The prospect of all-out war in the Middle East may have diminished ever so slightly. That certainly doesn't mean an end to the violence. That's it for this edition of The Daily. We'll see you again soon.